Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We uh, didn't want to wait too long, but we wanted to give everybody a chance to get on. Yeah, welcome to uh, Digital Denture uh, Fabrication uh, webinar. We're really kind of excited about this. And what's really interesting, John, is that the industry has been going through digitalization and CAD CAM manufacturing now for more than a decade. But it seems as though the denture has been left behind. It, they have. When you talk to removable laboratories, a lot of removable laboratories don't have any scanners of any sort in their laboratories. Yeah, well, there, there, digital workflow. there hasn't been a digital workflow. Yeah, and I think now is the time to start talking about it, and now is the time to start looking at it. So we're really glad you logged into it, and we're going to start to share with you some of the information. We're not 100% sure that there is a totally ripe solution for mainstream dentistry at this point, but it's coming very quickly now. So I'm glad you made it, and we'll share with you what we have. So why don't we uh, Let's bring off. up our presentation and, uh, yeah. and and move on with the program? Yeah, perfect. Okay, that's fine. So we can move on to slide two, which I think we do here. Okay, use the wheel. You can okay. use the wheel for moving the slides. So here's our agenda. Um, we're going to give a little introduction. We're going to go over removable partial dentures. We're going to talk about digital dentures, um, 3D printing and its role in things. And we'll talk a little bit about the business opportunities of digital dentures. So the interesting thing is partial dentures really have already been uh, made digital, and a lot of people are using digital production for digital dentures. Uh, three shape some time ago gave us the ability to scan uh, and design a partial denture. Uh, Exocad has done that as well. Yes. Uh, so people have been working with some different workflows. And we're going to share with you what's the latest uh, up to date to this point on partial dentures to start. Now we'll move to full dentures. So Three Shapes given us some really neat abilities uh, for partial denture design. Uh, the nice thing is, is their newer scanners enable us to scan a model and it can pick up pencil marks. So we have the ability to now design a model, uh, design on the model, the, the design of the partial, and then go ahead and use those pencil marks as though we were doing a wax up in a conventional type. We have some scanners that even read the color as well, so you sure. can indicate what what needs to go where and, and highlight things. And one of the beauties of that is if you've got a digital workflow established, if you're a full service laboratory, if you're a Crown and Bridge laboratory who's looking to get into the removable market, which I think is a very smart decision. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. But you're able to have someone who's a, a scanner or a designer um, fabricating partial dentures by having your partial denture technician design and survey the cast and draw the design for the designer and then hand it off to your digital department and let them run with it from there. So it really minimizes the amount of involvement that you have to have your highly trained partial denture technician involved in the process. Yeah, now another nice thing from 3Shape also, if we go through some of the features that 3Shape has added to make us even be able to design a better partial denture is during the design phase, they enable us to add the denture teeth. And by doing that, you know, certainly we will have our connectors in the right places and our uh, mesh work in the proper places. So I think, you know, uh, especially with the lack of high quality dental technicians in the partial denture arena today, uh, having the ability to see the end product while you're doing the design can, can make uh, removable laboratories uh, provide improved partial dentures. Yeah, the bad news for the really high-end partial laboratory is you're going to have a whole lot of competition really quickly. Um, the ability to do things like tube teeth and um, metal pontics and, and exotic connectors, there's a lot of different connectors you can use, a lot of different kinds of lattice work. So it gives you the ability to turn out a very impressive partial um, without a whole lot of effort. So it really lets you expand your portfolio in the removable area. Sure. Um, so here we have kind of already talked about it, but if you take a look um, 
it, it, the back of this partial denture, the, the palate area, you could see that the partial had followed the blue lines, and you could see blue lines uh, on the left below the saddle area as well, where those two molars have been cut out uh, for uh, layering, you know, of acrylic, I guess. Yeah, and again, this just works really well for being able to maximize um, the productivity of your more highly skilled technicians and keep people in the in the realm they're comfortable with. So if you've got somebody who's very comfortable in the digital world, you can let them stay there. If you've got somebody who's very comfortable in the analog world, you can let them stay there and you merge the two technologies via the scanner and the software. Right. So we really have two options when it comes to removable partial dentures. It, both are being done today. And I would suggest that uh, casting, that designing in, in 3Shape or an ExoCAD system, and then going to 3D printing, and then going to casting your partials is quite common today. In addition to that, there's laser centering or SLM technology, which just goes directly from design to laser centering a chrome cobalt partial. Uh, so both of these technologies are somewhat viable, uh, and each has its own challenges, which we can take a closer look at now. Absolutely, and I, I can speak kind of personally to, to both of these as labs that I've worked with um, have done these both ways. Um, we also have an upcoming course that we're doing in conjunction with BAGO. That's going to be in early November. It's on our website that you can go and reference. That's going to actually take you through the whole process if you wanted to do this. Or, you know, the beautiful thing about that course is if you're a laboratory that's not currently offering partials and want to be able to, it's going to take you all the way through. Uh, so that's, that's kind of an exciting development. And here, actually, I happen to like the concept if you want to cast partials to work with the BAGO system. Uh, they're coming out with a brand new Verseo S, which is the second uh, generation 3D printer. And uh, the nice thing about this solution, it's not like you're buying somebody's 3D printer and then you're left alone with investments and, and you know, burnout procedures and casting procedures and metals. It's a relatively closed system. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it, it is a relatively closed system, but it can be as open as you want. But the nice thing is, is if we start at the bottom, like John had mentioned, they offer full training programs. So you can learn how to design. You learn how to use the printer, and then you understand about the investment, the burnouts, the casting, and the alloys. So you have this comprehensive system that you can bring into your laboratory and not be doing R&D work based on the fact that you picked up some company's printer and you're deciding to go from hand waxing to printing. And how are you going to get those partials to fit? And, and one of the nice things with their printer, too, is it's, it's relatively streamlined. It was designed for dental from the ground up, and it's got some unique features to keep you following protocol. Um, basically, the, the materials have RFID chips on them that you put on the, um, the container that holds the material so that when you plug it into the machine, it automatically will set it up to run that material. So you don't have to worry about not having the right program in or, or not treating the material properly and things like that. So it, it has a lot of safeguards built into it. So for, for especially for a novice, it's a great way to go. And Bago is a very high-end partial um, company. So it gives you an opportunity to break into the partial world at the top end of the spectrum. Yeah, and it's truly something that Bago has been involved in for Forever. So, so many decades. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a the Walmart product. Yeah, so a little shifting bit. Shifting gears a little. Yeah, yeah, shifting gears a little and coming into newer products. Um, in my laboratory now, they're actually milling acetyl resin partials. Uh, the material mills incredibly easily. It, it mills probably nicer than PMMA and easier than PMMA. Uh, you could design it in, that's not an in that you stay in, I'm sorry about that, but you could design it in <laughs> tree shape or exocad. Uh, you mill it dry. And these partials are, are considerably more flexible than a chrome cobalt partial, but not nearly not comparable to like a flexible partial, your conventional type flexible partial. And the interesting thing about this is we've made some of these acetyl resin partials for patients that had had chrome cobalt partials. And it seems though almost unanimously these patients prefer acetyl resin partials. You know, the clasps are white, 
they are more comfortable as there's no metal digging into their palates or you know behind their tongue. Uh, they're just more comfortable with it. It's more aesthetic and it's really easy manufacturing. We process the teeth to the partial just with a simple pour technique. So it gives us a very, very inexpensive, nice solution for patients. I would say if you want to do this, the only thing you'll want to consider is when you're designing the partials, that you tend to need them to be more beefy. A little more robust. Yeah, a little more robust than the way you would design a chrome cobalt partial. You know, you don't want to be polishing this and, and, and finishing it and end up perfing it and having to go back to square one. You know, it's uncanny. It, I remember a survey of patients with the clear palates on dentures, and the patients felt that with a clear palate, the denture fit better and weighed less. In reality, if the thickness was the same, there was no difference in the weight. Um, there was no difference whatsoever, but it was psychosomatic. You know, it's just the patient sees it, likes it, and they perceive something, and it transfers to, to the product. And any way that we can get more success, we'll grab it. Yeah, and the other thing about the acetyl resin, if you if you happen to own a mill that takes a 98 millimeter disc, you can mill acetyl resin in it. So rolling mills, VHF mills, it's you know pretty much an endless list. Yeah, if you go to Cap Academy, we did a program relatively recently on um, on the Zerlux acetyl, um, and we talked about the partial applications, and we had Chris Shermerhorn going over. Um, some of the process. So if you have interest in this, um, there is more information on, on the CAP Academy website. And here actually I added this slide for uh, a reason in that, you know, a lot of the mills we have out there, the milling strategies for acetyl resin partial will not be quick to get this. There's a lot of surface area on this partial. Uh, so I kind of like the DWX52 disc changer mill from Roland. You know, Roland uh, has been a leader in the industry for years. And about a year ago came out with this disc changing mill. And what's really nice about this, if you want to put some partials in at the end of the day, this uh, mill has a six, six disc changer built into it. So, I mean, you can load this thing up with a six acetyl resin discs. And, you know, some of the discs you'll get two partials out of. Some you may only get one. But uh, so you may be able to get yourself nine partials milled through the night, which to me is uh, a high productivity with lights out manufacturing, you know, unintended, which is a nice thing. Yeah, the automation is wonderful. You know, during the day you can be using it by having several different shades of zirconia in there, um, or you could have several different shades of PMMA in there. Um, again, the lights out manufacturing feature is fantastic. You don't have to worry about changing things out. And they tend to pay for themselves very quickly, the add-on of the of having a changer um, mill as opposed to a, a single disc sure. type operation. Yeah, it turns the mill into a 24-hour production machine versus you don't need to pay somebody over. Time is something we can't control. And any time yeah. we can we can take advantage of it and turn one day into two or three, it's it's a wonderful situation. Right. So the other production method is, you know, you go from design direct to a chrome cobalt frame through selective laser melting, uh, SLM. And honestly, uh, this is a very difficult thing to get right. Uh, the, the equipment is extremely expensive as well, so you're probably going to have a difficult time getting an ROI to work. But if it's something that you're interested in, I know there's one company, 3D RPD, I think they're in uh, upstate New York and also in Canada. They are. And, yeah, and you could uh, definitely try them for their laser-scented partial dentures, which, you know, I've seen them, and they look quite nice to me. Yeah, they do a very nice job. They've been, um, anybody that's been at some of the shows in the last two, three years has probably seen their table. Their table's getting larger as they're getting more successful. Um, these machines, uh, EOS is the largest producer of, of the laser sintering machines, um, the most common used in dental. And the machines are incredibly expensive, but they really can do some amazing things. I remember a few years back at IDS um, seeing them laser sintering plastic to make uh, models, you know, uh, polymer. Um, so it, it's incredible technology, but incredibly expensive also. But it's also not plug and play. Not at I all. I think if you get involved in one of these technologies, you've got some R&D ahead of you to get things to fit Absolutely. right. It really works best in, in an outsourced model. Yeah. So it's, it, it's a good way if you don't want to have to deal with the casting and you want to get into the digital realm, this is a great way to start out. You know, get going with the training wheels, you know, eventually take them off 
and uh, work your way up to a, a more expensive or a more exotic bicycle or motorcycle. So another thing that I think is important to bring up in this whole workflow, you know, we're in the digital workflow, and I know for a fact that there's been literally thousands of removable partial dentures made with TRIO scans. So if you're not currently taking digital files in your laboratory, I think you should not be waiting any longer. You should be getting into a model builder software so that you can at least accept these files and uh, work with them. Uh, so you would do that as soon as you would get a scanner. So if you happen to be a, the owner of a dental laboratory and you haven't gone digital yet, uh, I'm going to believe that some of your customers are going to end up with devices like a TRIOS and they may call you and say, can you take TRIOS files? And if you say no, there's probably a pretty good chance that they're going to look for a larger laboratory, maybe a full service laboratory that does accept them. So I think it's time for dental laboratories yeah, to start the time is right. automation. You know, whether you're going to go to LMT East or DLOAC or if you're going to wait till Chicago, it should definitely be near the top of your bucket list and something that you're going to seriously commit to in the next uh, three to six months. Yeah, see, your primary starter program is a model builder program, and then you'd want the denture module also if you wanted to start to design your partial and full dentures. Those of you that haven't seen it before, that, that is a TRIO scanner. Um, it's like a gun, so it's very similar. When, when the dentist first starts using it, it's comfortable to them because it's like the cartridge system that they use for dispensing their impression material. Um, the size of the head is, is, is not too cumbersome uh, and works really well. And needless to say, it dovetails very well with the three-shape software and the three-shape lab scanners because it's all from the same company. Right. So I think that covers it for partial dentures. And, you know, if you have questions, you can type them in any time. We're going to hold them until the end. Uh, so let's move on to full dentures because this is really, I think, the next, what's next on the horizon for automating our dental laboratories. Uh, and I think we're looking at potentially a lot of different companies doing R&D work and invested a lot of money. I think some of the solutions are better than others, uh, which we'll get into a little bit here. And then we'll talk about the opportunities that exist and will be coming more to fruition in the coming months and it's not years it's just months for sure yeah this is this is on the short the short side so here's like the three major systems that are out there and Avident was was really kind of first to market um, they're out in Arizona and um, they've kind of expanded and changed and, and listened to customers and and brought more ways of using their product to market um, the AMD device was their initial um, platform and a lot of these revolve around gothic arch tracers and require the dentist to kind of modify what they do to a certain extent or add things that they don't typically do. Um, so the adoption by the dentist is sometimes meets a little bit of resistance as a result of that. And as these companies have seen that, they've tried to bring things a little bit more mainstream or give dentists and laboratories some options to do it more than one way. Um, the PALA system um, again, it's very similar to the Avident, uh, it's Horaeus Colzer, um, and again, it's a gothic arch tracer type of a system. Um, they have some very nice accoutrements that help the dentist to take measurements and give us information to fabricate our dentures in a better fashion and give us better success. So that's the good news, and the bad news is that some dentists don't, they already feel they spend too much time on a denture when you start telling them that you want them to take other measurements and do other things, sometimes you get some pushback. And you gain a little bit of that back when you tell them that you can save them some visits. So you may spend a little more time on the visits you have, but there's going to be fewer of them. So there's a benefit there. Ivoclar is uh, the, um, the third one kind of to the game with their system. And again, it, um, it revolves around some, some interesting technology to help um, process the proper vertical and capture centric relation and things of that sort. So you can see the, 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 the major denture companies are at the forefront of this product and it's, it, it's time, if not right around the corner, is, is now. So I added this slide myself and I, I think it's an interesting conversation because, you know, I've known about Gothic Arch tracings for absolute decades and, you know, it's just something that really never caught on. 
uh, in, in mainstream dentistry. And here we see the three de different denture types versus conventional in the number of appointments. And what we're looking at is our conventional dentures are taking about five appointments. And it, indeed, they're actually taking more because after the delivery of the denture, the patient generally comes back with sore spots, so the dentures need to be adjusted. So it might be seven or eight appointments, really. And then I think due to uh, the lack of complete solutions, the companies that are coming out with these abbreviated systems are abbreviating the system because they don't have a solution that will necessarily give us a try and venture. And I think that's a problem. And I also think that for laboratory owners to convince dentists to do Gothic arch measurements uh, and tracings is going to be problematic. And I think it's going to be problematic for dentists to do it well. If it was going to be simple, the number of denture visits would have been reduced decades ago. And this is my personal feeling. It's not necessarily fact. Certainly plenty of good education, you know, from Massad to Turbifilt to Prime. Right. I mean, there, there, there were great lecturers out there doing courses on a regular basis and bringing this technology to the dentists and to the dental laboratories for the past 40, 50 years. Um, it's nothing new. Um, it's like what's old is new again. And it, it's a way to try to get the vertical correct and get the, uh, the measurements where they belong so that you can proceed more accurately to a try-in. Because the try-in is going to take some time. It's going to take some expense because typically you're printing your try-in and you don't want to have, you know, whereas before when you had to increase your vertical a little bit, okay, so it was a quick reset. Um, now it's, it's, it's an even quicker reset on the computer, but you need to print another try-in and we're trying to stay competitive with cost, and that can eat into that cost very quickly. So. Yeah, but I, I think the key takeaway on the slide is that, you know, Gothic arch tracings have been around for decades, and I would guesstimate that they're done on considerably less than 1% of cases. Absolutely. And they could save dentist uh, appointments, and if the dentist could do them, it would be routine. Absolutely. So and I agree. think if you can get your dentist's that aren't doing a lot of dentures now that, that send their dentures out. If you can get them involved in something that's a little more predictable and something they can have a little more control and a little bit more preview on by being able to share setups with them um, and screenshots so they can see what things are going to look like and give you feedback, um, they might enjoy them more. And as they start to enjoy them more, the Gothic Arch Tracers and some of these other measuring devices and some of these other techniques are things you can certainly introduce as you go along and maybe cut back on a visit or two or maybe just end up with a much better result. But to go into it with the premise that you're going to be able to do in two or three visits, with all and this is going to solve everything, and, oh, it's really simple. You just use this tray and do this technique, and you move on from there, is, is a little bit of a misnomer. Yeah, to me, I think it's more of a niche product that you may yeah. be able to take your one percenters, your best docs, and get that and work with this technology with them. But mainstream, I question it. But I've been wrong in the past, so who knows? <clears throat> So here we have multiple options for scanning for dentures, but you know, obviously we're going to scan models and we'll scan wax rims that have had marks by the dentist put on them, and this just happens to be a new E-series three-shape scanner. Uh, so we'll go through the workflow here a little bit. Yeah, it's just a matter of taking our, our analog steps and bringing them into the digital realm for our design process. Now, so we can talk about the CAD. Uh, I think we all know about scanning. so. We could design, with three shape, we could design one arch, or we could d design both arches simultaneously. Whereas in ExoCAD, you can only do both arches simultaneously, so it's not appropriate for a single denture. Uh, if you go ahead, now what we could do is we could select teeth from made the libraries that have been created of stock denture teeth. We can use those teeth in the final denture. Or we can even go ahead and use our own libraries. We can use our crown and bridge libraries for denture teeth if we're not going to be using a stock tooth in the denture. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk about a good denture, a better denture, and a best denture. So we have three different levels of dentures and how we see them potentially being made. But these are your options for your tooth forms. So you can use existing denture teeth that that have libraries, or you can use any library you want, provided you're either going to print a mill of denture teeth. And you know your customer base. You know how you've got those dentists who 
typically use the same four or five molds and they know those molds by heart and they know what they look like and they know what they want and when they start asking you for that mold um, they expect to get that back so by having the a lot of the major molds available to you that allows you to satisfy that segment of your of your customer population which is really important right now another thing that three shape enables us to do which we'll go through quickly here in a minute is that we can do immediate dentures with three shape software also and we'll show you how that works and in addition the nice thing I like about the three shape workflow <clears throat> is if you want you can work within it in an abbreviated uh, clinical appointment methodology uh, or workflow or if you want we can stay with the conventional, very accepted five appointment workflow. And we'll show you how that works. So first step after you scan is obviously to do the CAD. And in this particular case, there were molds of teeth, uh, common teeth selected to do the setup. And you simply do that setup uh, without wax. And what's amazing is once you get your setup done, it's really just one click of the mouse and you get your wax up. The wax just flows in and uh, your wax up is complete. So I would suggest that once you're familiar with the software, that setups can on a, on, on a single latch can probably be accomplished in 10 minutes or less. And then there's one click for the wax up. So it's basically set up and wax up in about 10 minutes. Yeah, your standard ideal situation can be accomplished very quickly. And then if you want to get a little more exotic, you can go in and enhance your ginger, but you can go in and build in some asymmetry in your setup and, and create some of those those things that I think us as technicians tend to like more than the, the dentist and the patient sometimes, but um, those options are all there. So here's the immediate denture workflow. So basically you select the tooth uh, that's going to be removed and you go ahead and you push remove and it removes it and then you would move on to the other three teeth and remove those as well. They can also facilitate your bone reduction. You know, you basically put the plate over the area, and that'll take take away the crest of the ridge to get rid of those those areas that uh, you know are going to be lost either through extraction or that are going to be smoothed out. So you end up with a more predictable result. One of the things I suggest strongly on these two is is producing a clear base plate, um, like a surgical tray, to send out with your immediate dentures. It allows you to give that dentist a lot more predictability when they can take that clear surgical tray that clear base plate and put it in position before they try in that immediate denture. After they've done their extractions, when they've done a rough close, they can see if there's some areas where they need to do a little more osteoplasty and take that bone down a little bit further, or they need to snip a little more tissue and snug things up a little bit tighter so that they're not impinging on, on the ridge. And this way, when they go to try in the denture, they know that they're going to get a full seat and they're not going in and grinding randomly trying to figure out where they're hitting. Um, it eliminates the whole pressure indicating paste, um, chase the sore spot, you know, prematurely around the arch, trying to get things to seat all the way. It lets them really see where they're hitting prematurely, make the adjustments either to the denture base or to the bone or to the tissue to accommodate a full seat. Yeah, and I think so. really what's big about this is that it will result in having a better patient experience, you know, less pain. Absolutely. Through uh, trying to wear this immediate denture. Absolutely. Faster insertion times, more predictable. Yeah. Um, it, it's a great feature. Okay, so let's get on to the try-in because this is a big piece of why so many existing automated denture solutions are going to the two-step because they haven't figured out how to make a try-in denture. So with the three-shape, it's really interesting. We have the ability to save three different files uh, once the setup in wax up is complete. One of the files is the placement and alignment of the teeth themselves. A second STL file is the base without the teeth. And then the third STL file is the entire denture is one STL file. So teeth and pink base all in one STL file. So what we're advocating and what we're really looking seriously at here is taking that third STL file that includes the teeth in the base and going ahead and man um, producing a monoblock of that denture. 
so that, you know, it's probably going to be an all-white denture, and it's just going to be used for the try-in. Uh, the dentist can then go ahead, get the patient in, make needed modifications. You know, he can put a line on it to change the midline. He can change the vertical. He can shorten the teeth, do whatever is necessary. Uh, now, you know, I think from my perspective, I don't generally see a lot of dentists that actually physically move denture teeth all that much. So I think this works pretty close to as well for the dentist uh, to show the patient and to review the setup, the initial setup. And they can get creative with their, their, their techniques for doing it. They can use a black marker and shorten the teeth by putting the black mark so the patient can see where, they're, where, where they want to put that relative to the, the, the smile line, the lip line. They can use a marker to indicate where they want to move um, the zenith of the tissue to. You know, so they, they can show us where they want their pink to stop and start. They can show us where they want their incised ledges, and they can communicate if we need to rotate the occlusal plane um, because of the way it transferred um, from the computer to the in vivo situation. Yeah, I really think anything they could do with a wax try-in, they could do with this try-in, and from there... Probably faster and easier, too. Yeah, maybe it may be faster and easier. And from there, we have the ability in 3Shape to take that returned try and denture and rescan it and remerge it to the original setup. And then we can easily update or change the design to fit within the new parameters of that try and denture to manufacture the final denture. And it's great because they can take a wash inside of that as well. So if, if the borders still need a little bit of work or if there's a, you know, if the retromolar pads weren't captured completely or if, if the Frena is, is too close, they can, they can open up um, you know, areas to create more room for the freedom. It, it, it's, it's got a lot of really nice benefits to it, and they take a light wash inside, and we can scan that, and that transforms that denture base into a much better denture base than it was at the try-in stage. You know, it's generally from a regular base plate. They're not going to really get that much of an understanding of the fit of the denture. I don't know why this slide is here. Okay, so this really... Just the different ways of doing it. Yeah, so here... We have a 3D printed uh, STL file of a full upper and lower denture try-in. So this is more or less what the try-ins are going to look like if they came out of a printer. This happens to be a Form 2 printer, which is a considerably sub $10,000 printer that really anybody in business can, in a dental laboratory can afford it today. And it prints these dentures, these try-in dentures very, very inexpensively. I'm not 100% sure, but I would kind of go out on a limb and say these cost less than four dollars in materials maybe three dollars in materials per denture yeah not terrible from form labs yeah it's really inexpensive and this is what it would look like in the mouth and i would suggest if you really want you could probably toss a little pink on uh around the teeth you could do it with wax maybe or whatever if you, if you wanted to give the dentist and the patient a little better visual on uh, what that what that's going to look like when it's done so it goes from cad setup uh to saving your STL files and then 3D printing the STL file uh, and then trying in and adjusting as needed. <clears throat> now, in addition, I, I didn't put it in here. If you, if you don't have a printer and you want to just try the technology, you could put a PMMA disc in a mill and mill these dentures, but this is going to take a lot, a lot of hours in like a roller mill to mill these, so you're not, it's not going to work well in a, in a workflow for you long term. Yeah, it's, it's not a... An efficient process. It, it's a stopgap if you needed to. Yeah, if you want to get into it, try it with a customer too. So now I want to get into our options and manufacturing processes for what I call a good and a better and a best denture solution. Uh, and I think all of them are right around the corner from us having a solution to, you know, a cost-effective, probably the most cost-effective denture you can make, and then something in the middle, and then I think we can digitize a pretty high-end denture as well. So we'll show you how we think those are going to pan out. Yeah, what the evolution is probably going to look like. Right. So from my perspective, at this point, I've looked at a lot of materials, and some of the materials are now getting FDA approval for printing. Uh, and I think by the end of the year, there'll probably be at least six or eight different pink materials available for printing denture bases. Um, that said, I don't believe any of the printers, or at least none of the printers that I'm aware of, uh, will enable fiber 
to be incorporated into the base. And some of the pink materials are probably not exactly the right color now. I think over time they'll get better. But at any rate, I think print technology is going to facilitate a very inexpensive, well-fitting denture base. And think about zirconia. Think about you know few full-service laboratories. You people that um, that are familiar with zirconia. You remember where zirconia was when it first came out with with the very high value and very monochromatic and you know the whole more brawn than beauty type thing. To where zirconia has come to now, where it rivals the finest material. Um, on the market, even in a monolithic state. So I think we're going to see the same thing as the material gets adopted and as more companies get involved and as more effort is put into it, um, the printed materials will continue to get better. Um, at this point, they are, um, they're kind of what you see there. They're, they're relatively monochrome and, and not terribly exciting. So uh, where we see those initially is going to be as, as the entry level point. Right. Uh, now, when we look at a, maybe the best solution, and the better solution is somewhere in the middle of this where you could take a, a printed base uh, and then and put in a quality tooth, tooth put a yeah. good, good quality tooth in it. So we go to the best, I think we're going to find that some of our high-end packable materials will be provided to us by the acrylic manufacturers in a disc form. It will just simply go ahead and mill the denture base from those materials. Now what's really interesting about both of these technologies is I really expect we're likely to get a better fitting denture, uh, either printed or milled. Because as you know, acrylic shrinks uh, when it goes through the chemical curing process. And as a result, I would venture to guess that we may have errors in fit of a thousand microns. So I'm not really sure what that Absolutely. number is. We all know metal to metal contact on our flasks, but how often the technicians always ensure you have metal to metal contact and you think about what some of those flasks look like after production for a year or two um, and we all know how expensive a flask is so we're not replacing them on a regular basis or maybe as often as we should um, so you've got you know better verticals out of these you've got better borders you've got better paddle adaptation because you don't have the, the, the contraction of course if you're doing an injection system some of that is, is mitigated but not all of it and you've got the optimization of the chemistry of that acrylic. Um, so your residual monomer levels tend to be much lower, so again, better tissue response, the strength is gonna be optimized. So there's, there's, there's a myriad of, of benefits um, to these, whether they're printed or milled um, as a result of those factors. Okay, so here is our low cost solution where we have our good I would suggest that we could take uh, milled, either probably take milled teeth that, you know, we could just take the design and take that STL file and mill teeth inexpensively, or we could take uh, a, a denture tooth that's not super expensive. Uh, I'm not sure what the portrait IPN, are you familiar with that tooth? Yeah, portrait IPN is a great tooth. It's one yeah. of the higher line dense ply teeth. Um, they're beautiful. Um, you know, any high end tooth you could use to right. get that better quality. So you're using a, a standard base plate with a premium tooth, whether it be something like a Cangelor or something like a Physiodens from, from Vita or a, a Mondial from, from Reyes Colzer or, or any of those, those premium denture teeth um, could be used to elevate that standard base plate to a, a higher end denture by having the, the, the denture teeth be a premium quality. And then obviously we're looking at our high end or our best denture being a nicely milled base with a, with a real high end tooth put into that. And again, you could also mill the base and mill teeth and put the two together. Yeah, yeah you know, we, we all know there's, there's an awful lot of roads to Rome and um, they all have their advantages. You've got to look at, um, at what works best in your business model, what works best for your customers. Um, and it's something that's going to be constantly changing. You know how these things get when they get into the laboratory. It, 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 it mutates rapidly, and um, what works on one end of town might not work on the other end of town, and what works in one corner of the laboratory might not work in the other corner of the laboratory. But the beauty of this is that as this technology is moving forward, there are lots of different ways to do it. So you're sure to find a way that's going to work for you, which is the good news. Yeah, not only that, but I think... <clears throat> For the most part, 
and I'm sorry if I, I don't mean to insult anybody out there, but for the most part, I think the, the real, real talented denture technicians uh, in numbers, in mass numbers, are aging people. Uh, we need a solution to replace those people as they retire. Absolutely. And I really think automating the denture is going to become a necessity for us. Absolutely. No, no, no two ways about that. And really, this slide I, I put in is just to show you that it, it's not it's really cool. Yeah, it is really <laughs> cool. And it's not just about automating the denture. I mean, you can go as far as you can imagine with this automation process. So you can take a conventional denture that, uh, you know, this might be more common on a lower case because the lower dentures don't fit as well. So you'll probably do something like this on a lower more often than an upper. But, you know, make a bar and a superstructure that you then have a denture uh, bonded to uh, with whatever teeth you want. And, you know, you, you give the patient something that has a lot of retention. It's almost replacing, uh, you know, their natural dentition. You know, they have something that's, you know, near angulose that's retrievable for cleaning and it supports the lips because of all Max the... case you take the yeah. palate out, you know, you, yeah, you, 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 you do some really it's, incredible things. It's just analyst what we can do here. And um, being able to merge those technologies with the denture as opposed, as opposed to having to then process the denture on top of and around those structures. If it's all done at the same time, you've got your receptor sites, it's just a matter of bonding the, the meso structure inside of the denture. Um, and, and then uh, having your your well-designed bar and your your, your well-designed attachments to uh, to stabilize things. Yeah, so I would suggest. So, it's so I would suggest the reason for me putting the slide in is for you not just to be considering the concept of manufacturing, you know, digital dentures, but you know, you can really take this to a level uh, where you could take a denture and be selling it for, you know, $5,000 or $4,000 or $3,000. The digital world opens up all kinds of, of possibilities. I mean, you've got digital planning, you've got surgical guides, you've got um, bone reduction guides, you've got, um, you, you're really able to, yeah, to take this all the way through. And the wonderful thing about this, um, Bob and I were talking earlier today about um, an article that we shared, and some of the things that really help you retain dentists or get new dentists is helping them with new technology. And when you can bring them a new technology or you can bring them something complex and make it simple for them, you're then becoming a trusted advisor. You're becoming an integral part of their team. And it's like plugging the umbilical cord back in. They're now dependent on you. And you tend to have much more of a peer relationship than you do otherwise. And that's always a good thing. Okay, so I have a couple of business considerations uh, to automating your removable departments here. It, just some things things to think about uh, as you move forward over the coming months. And really, if you're a crown and bridge lab, what's really, really interesting is it's very highly likely that you already know scanning and CAD and CAM. And sorry I didn't get the CAM typo there. Um, and, you know, you've probably milled PMMA in the past, so you understand milling on that end. And, and so many labs now also have 3D printers and have 3D printing technology. So absolutely, if you're a Crown & Bridge only lab, you will need some removable knowledge. But the knowledge is much more easy to obtain than the entire skill set of producing an analog denture. Yeah, and you can probably get by with adding one or two denture technicians um, to be to your staff and supplement that with your digital department um, and you could have you know you, you could get what you would need normally four to six technicians to be able to accomplish sure that the only do removables um, you know your removable technology um, but you can become much more efficient with this um, it'll open up all kinds of avenues for you it will appeal to a different um, group of, of, of clients. Um, the early adopters, the, the digital and the tech savvy dentists um, love this kind of thing. And if you're just a removal laboratory that doesn't have any of those elements, they might pass you by and go to a full service lab that can bring those elements to the table. It's not that hard at this point for you to get involved in the digital technology and have all those bells and whistles that the full service or the digital laboratories have. So it makes it very easy for you to get up to speed 
with that that part of the market. Um, it allows you to save money and labor. Um, you can shorten up your production workflows. You know. Um, now I put in the debt during a day. It really you're not going to provide the whole solution in a day, but if a, if a dentist really needs it. He needs the final denture converted in a day uh, after the try-in. It's very simple. You know, you can scan in the uh, try-in denture, make your changes, mill your base, cement in your teeth, and get that case delivered. Yeah. And, you know, the last item there, once you learn digital dentures, it's easy to go full service. Um, I don't know that I would say it's easy, but it's certainly much, much easier because you're already familiar with, with the CAD CAM concept and the softwares and all of the materials and equipment for the fixed procedures had been around so much longer than these removable materials have. So the evolution has really taken place with a lot of those things. So the, the workflows are much more streamlined and much more automated than, um, than the removable is at this point. Again, just because of the lifespan. You know how things are. You, you look at how where things start and where they end up with after time, and it, it's huge. Okay. You know, the things that you need. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, you've got to have a scanner. Um, you need to have a CAD solution. And you need to have an output device. So you're going to need something to get this into the digital world and the software that goes with that to be able to design. And then you're going to have to send it to your, your CAM software, which basically figures out all of the tool paths or all of the, um, the workings of your output device, which is either, as we said, going to be a mill or a printer depending upon which way you go, or your output device, as we said also initially, can be a centralized production facility, much like we talked about with that 3D RPD. I think that as we go forward, it's entirely possible that there will be outsource opportunities for, um, for denture bases and, and, and milling of denture teeth and things like that. So um, if you don't have an output device initially, you can certainly wait till you get some critical volume to add that or you can go ahead and add it now and, um, and be up and running with a full solution. And you just need a desire to learn. Passion and commitment is the key to success. Okay, so that concludes it. I want to thank everybody for attending. I think that concludes it. Did that conclude it? Yes, I didn't put a, uh, an end slide in here. But uh, let's see if we can read these questions, John. These are really small. Uh, what material, let's see. What material? Or resin is being, scroll down a little. Is it's being, being used, used with the Form Labs try-in. Is bonding the teeth to base a problem? Okay. Uh, I don't know the name of the material from Form Labs, but they do have a denture tooth material that's acceptable to use as a try-in material. Uh, it is white uh, or tooth colored. And um, to bond the teeth in right now, uh, I know with Form Labs, we can use the Form Labs liquid, the, the resin that we use to produce the, te the teeth and the base, can be used as the bonder between the tooth and the base. So basically you would take the teeth, try them in, uh, the slots and generally they would be milled in quadrants so you have an anter anterior quadrant two posterior quadrants put a little bit of the uh, actual material painted into the holes in the denture put it in put it in a light cure unit yeah there, there are there are different um, materials for different systems I know Ivoclar has their own material yeah, they have that adhesive. is made specifically for bonding the teeth to the denture base um, some people are simply if, if, if you're milling um, then you've got acrylic in your denture base, you've got acrylic in your teeth, so you can then just use your standard acrylics, your, your auto-polymerizing acrylics to add um, the teeth onto the denture base. Um, if you're using a composite printed material, you're going to have to have something to cross-link, so you're going to have to use a bonding agent to, uh, to facilitate that bond. Um, see what other questions we have. Uh, do you need a five-axis mill to mill a denture base? Absolutely. Where can you buy these? Um, Actually, I wouldn't run out to buy a mill to mill denture bases today uh, because I think what we need is a mill that will mill a denture base in like 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes tops. And I think the mills that we associate with Crown and Bridge 
uh, uh, not necessarily correct for milling dentures in that time frame. Uh, however, I do think uh, by year end, we'll be seeing milling machines that'll be appropriate to mill a denture base in, in that time frame. You know, the thing is we need bigger tools, so we need bigger spindles uh, to just kind of rip through this material very quickly. What about acrylic teeth? You must have the same set on digital library, or is there any other way? Um, what was that again? Acrylic teeth, you must have the same set on the digital library. Is there any other way? Yeah, you, actually, you have two choices you can go here. You can mill your teeth, or you can use stock teeth, uh, you know, the same teeth you would process into a denture today, provided there's a library of that tooth in the software, in the CAD software. Uh, now you could also use the library of a stock tooth and then mill that shape. Uh, so you could use a stock tooth if a dentist wants a particular mold, you could use that mold and then mill it, or you can buy it and uh, bond those into the denture. Yeah. And, and again, this is something, you know, all of this techn technology is advancing very rapidly. Um, when we scheduled this webinar, there were things that we anticipated being out that aren't quite ready yet. Um, so those things will be coming up. But we felt it's, it's gotten to a point where things are, are close enough and people have enough questions that we wanted to at least give you our spin on where we see things today and let you know that this, this is something you should be paying very close attention to. And if you haven't added it already, it should be on your short-term radar. Yeah, Rami, I'm not sure here. You know, Rami, I can tell you, Rami's asking about multi-layered uh, materials for aesthetics. And I, all I would say is that Rami is being worked on. I don't expect it's going to be a long period of time before we're able to mill teeth with multi-layered materials uh, that are likely going to be made from similar materials that denture teeth are made out of today. Um, and I think, what else? Thank you guys. You're very welcome, everybody. I appreciate your time. Uh, and I think that we'll be publishing a lot more on this in the coming months, as I think this is going to be a, a new major platform for dental laboratories. And if you're not aware of it, um, IDT is doing a program the end of October um, in Baltimore. Um, it's a digital denture mm -hmm. symposium. So if this is something you have a lot of interest in, that's certainly something you should um, look at and consider attending. Um, on the partial end of things, as I said, we've got a course that we're doing collaboration with Bago at their facility in Rhode Island, um, beginning of November. So this fall, there's a lot of events that are circulating around digital partials and digital dentures. Um, so keep, keep your eyes peeled. Um, go to our website and, and refer because we've got a lot of the details for these events on there. Um, as always, you know, thank you so much for, for, for giving up part of your day to spend it with us. And uh, Yeah, there's one more question here that I'll address here. Somebody's asking about uh, biocompatibility with Formlabs materials. Uh, the Formlabs material is now, I believe, appropriate for try-ins. And they're currently working with FDA uh, on a pink base material uh, for, for the final denture. And, uh, you know, the FDA, it's difficult to tell because if they come back with a question, it gets put off for 60 days. But, you know, we're starting to see some other print companies coming out with materials that have gotten FDA approval. And I truly believe that all of the print companies will soon have FDA cleared materials for the denture teeth and the denture base. Okay. So, again, folks, thanks so much for stopping in today and spending some time with us in the middle of what I'm sure is a very busy day. And uh, great attendance, especially for August. I know a lot of people are on vacation. Um, we will have this on the website so people can, can take a look at it if they need to. Um, or if you've got people who you want to see it, they can review it that way.